My, my name is Mark Siegler, and on behalf of the McLean Center for Clinical Medical Ethics, uh, I welcome you to the seventh lecture uh, in our series of 28 Wednesday noon lectures on ethical issues in healthcare reform. Uh, today's lecture, uh, I want to highlight, is co-sponsored by CHESS, the Center for Health and the Social Sciences, as a Regis J. Fallon lecture on health and law. The Fallon lectures receive generous support, receive generous support um, uh, from the University of Chicago alumnus, Dr. Martin Friedlander, uh, and Dr. Sheila Fallon Friedlander, uh, in remembrance of Sheila's father, a labor lawyer uh, and negotiator in the steel and aluminum industry. Um, since 2006, the Fallon Lecture Series has featured speakers who address the important issues at the interface of health and law and bring together students and experts from the campus for discussions across disciplines. Professor Anoop Milani, raise your hand Anoop, and Dr. David Meltzer uh, are the organizers of the Regis Fallon Lecture Series. Uh, just before I introduce today's speaker, I also want to call your attention to the McLean Center's 25th Anniversary Ethics Conference that will meet this Friday and Saturday uh, both days at the University of Chicago Law School at 1111 East 60th Street. Uh, conference brochures are available on the table in the back, um, and I hope some of you will look at the brochures and uh, sign up. Uh, it's free of charge, but, but register for the meeting. Uh, I'm delighted then to introduce today's speaker, um, uh, who is uh, Professor Daniel Kessler, uh, from Stanford University. Uh, an expert on health policy and healthcare finance, uh, Dan Kessler uh, is a professor at the Stanford Graduate School of Business and at the law school, is a senior fellow at Stanford's Hoover Institute and a research associate at the National Bureau of Economic Research. Professor Kessler received his JD from the Stanford Law School and his PhD in economics uh, at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. His research interests include empirical studies in antitrust law, law and economics, and the economics of healthcare. Professor Kessler's recent book entitled Healthy, Wealthy, and Wise, Five Steps to a Better Healthcare System outlines how market-based healthcare reform in the United States can help fix the system's current problems. Dan Kessler has also written extensively on healthcare reform for the Wall Street Journal and in Health Affairs, and has won awards from Stanford, the National Institute for Healthcare Economic, the National Institute for Health Economics Association and the International Health Economics Association. Today, Professor Kessler will speak to us on the topic, Three Principles of Real Health Reform. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to Dan Kessler. Uh, thank you, uh, thank you, Mark, for uh, your very kind introduction. I just uh, hope you didn't set people's expectations too high. It's a, it's a, a real honor for me to be here, uh, being hosted not just by the McLean Center, uh, but also by the uh, Center for Health and the Social Sciences to give the Fallon Lecture. Uh, and it's, uh, I really appreciate the uh, invitation. The University of Chicago has a wonderful group of people, uh, Mark, Anu, uh, David, and uh, so many others, Casey Mulligan uh, in the Economics Department who's working on issues of health policy reform, who in fact was here uh, just a couple of weeks ago. Uh, I can't go through the whole list of people because then I wouldn't have any time left to talk about what I came to talk about, but uh, this visit is a wonderful opportunity for me to get to see many of my old friends and uh, learn what, what some new friends might, uh, might be doing in, in this uh, important area. So uh, the topic for my 
uh, talk today is three principles for real health reform. Um, let me start by just defining what I mean by real health reform. I don't think this will be too controversial, but it's, I think, worth spending a few moments on to make sure we're all on the same uh, page. So uh, real health reform uh, has got uh, three parts. Uh, it will s reduce, probably not eliminate, spending on low value care, which is one of the problems that we've got in this country. Uh, second, it'll expand coverage, another, obviously another problem. Uh, and third, it'll be self-financing. Self that is, it's not going to kick the can down the road about how to pay for this any longer. So that's what real health reform is. Now, uh, real health reform encompasses lots of different things. Um, some people might want a lot of coverage expansion uh, and be willing to take a lot of new taxes uh, in order to pay for it. Some people uh, might want less coverage expansion and, and be willing to take less uh, new taxes to pay for it. Uh, neither of these positions, in my view, is right or wrong. Uh, they're just putting different weights on these, these three elements of real reform. Okay, so if you agree with me on that, uh, translating these goals into policy, that's the hard part. And for that, uh, I'm gonna offer you three principles and I'm gonna talk through these in some detail uh, in the time that I, I have here today. Uh, the first principle uh, is difficult trade-offs. Uh, if you believe that those are the three uh, things that we should be striving for in real health reform, there's going to be difficult trade-offs. And I'm going to talk about what I like to think of as an iron triangle of these trade-offs uh, in more detail in, in a second. Second principle is uh, more is not necessarily better. And uh, I think that follows from the broad view of real health reform, that if you think we've got a lot of uh, spending on low value care, which I think pretty much everyone's in agreement that that's true, then more is not necessarily better because some of that stuff um, is, is not providing good value for the resources that it's consuming. And uh, the third principle is that everybody has to pay more. Uh, everybody has to pay more at the point of service starting right now uh, as much as they can stand. Now, everybody doesn't have to pay the same amount more because some, if you don't have any money, you can't pay as much more as, for example, I can afford to pay, but everybody has to pay more. We can't get away from this uh, real principle, and I'm going to, I think, talk through why I think that's true in a moment. Um, although my talk's not about the Affordable Care Act, uh, I, I would like to spend some time contrasting these principles with the principles of the Affordable Care Act. Um, so the principles of the Affordable Care Act are uh, everybody who likes their current insurance can keep it. Uh, private insurance premiums are going to go down. We're going to extend coverage to roughly half of the uninsured. I mean, there's some discussion over how many people are forecast to be covered once the ACA is fully phased in, but it's, it's roughly half of the, of the uninsured. Uh, we're only going to increase taxes on people with high incomes, and the budget deficit will fall. Okay, so these are the stated principles of the Affordable Care Act, but unfortunately, all of them can't be true at the same time. Uh, and that's, uh, as the problem is, as we're now starting to see, uh, it, it just can't be true. And, and that's the first principle of, of real health reform, is, is what I call the Iron Triangle. So what's the Iron Triangle of trade-offs that real health reform has. Uh, as you want more of one of these things, you've got to accept sacrifice on one of the others. So if you want more uh, scope and magnitude of a coverage expansion, uh, either you've got to have higher taxes and more deficits, uh, or you've got to have uh, higher private insurance premiums and fewer benefits. Uh, if you want lower taxes and less deficits, that's OK, too. Uh, but then you can't have as much coverage expansion and you can't uh, have as generous private insurance uh, benefits and as low private insurance premiums. Um, so 
it seems like this should make sense to most people, that this is the fundamental basket of trade-offs that we've, we've got to face, but uh, the fundamental problem with the Affordable Care Act is that it's based on a denial of this reality. Uh, we can't have coverage for half the uninsured. Everybody get to keep their insurance who likes it, lower private insurance premiums, and only more taxes on high-income people. It's not possible. Uh, and I'm going to explain to you why that's true. And this is important because the only way we can reach a national consensus on where we want to be on these difficult trade-offs, and, and I don't pretend to have an answer to that. Uh, you know, who knows where, where we should be as a country. But the only way to reach a national consensus on this is for us to start having an honest discussion uh, about them, which, which unfortunately we, we haven't done. Okay. So let me talk about the private insurance premiums and benefits piece uh, of the triangle for a second. Um, <clears throat> one of the earliest selling points for the Affordable Care Act was that it would reduce private insurance premiums uh, by $2,000 to $2,500 uh, per family. This was a point that was sold. It was based on a back of the envelope calculations that took a highly optimistic view of uh, its cost control measures, uh, cost control measures that were ultimately rejected by the CBO, um, but nonetheless are still being used uh, by supporters of the law to convince people of the underlying principle that reform can pay for itself. Um, so, so this claim, it, it's just incorrect. It's simply incorrect. Uh, for most of us, uh, the Affordable Care Act will probably increase our insurance premiums a little bit not a whole lot, a modest amount. If you have insurance from a large employer, uh, you're gonna have to pay some new taxes. There's taxes on health insurance, there's a tax on medical devices, there's a per capita reinsurance charge. I can go through the whole list of things. They're not that large, uh, but you know, collectively they might amount to a percentage point, something in that uh, ballpark. Uh, then there's the fact that we're expanding demand for health services. Uh, while keeping the supply, at least in the short run, relatively fixed. And that's, you know, that's also, that's okay, but when you do that, prices will rise, right? If you expand demand and supply is relatively fixed, the price of the thing is going to go up. Uh, and so that's going to happen also. Uh, there's reasonable, people can disagree on how large that is, and, and I don't, you know, I don't have a specific number uh, in mind. In addition, we're all gonna have to pay a little bit more for our insurance to comply with new regulations that the Affordable Care Act imposes. Some of those might be good, some of them you might think are not good, uh, but there are a bunch of new regulations and they are cost increasing ones. So collectively, for people with uh, large employer self-insured uh, kinds of uh, coverage, I would say you're gonna have a small to modest increase in, in your premiums. Uh, for people on Medicare and Medicaid, I would say the Affordable Care Act is, is roughly a wash. Um, for some people, it's gonna be a minus. Uh, it's gonna be a minus for Medicaid beneficiaries who now have to compete with a much larger pool of people uh, who will also have Medicaid uh, coverage, uh, which you know, at least in California, is a very low paying uh, uh, set of uh, coverage. And so the product of having low Medicaid reimbursement is that Medicaid beneficiaries uh, have to wait. They don't get as good a service as somebody who has very high paying private insurance gets. And it, that varies across states. Some states have more versus less generous Medicaid. But uh, certainly when you expand the number of people on Medicaid, um, that's gonna create a bind for the people who were already uh, enrolled in it. Um, some Medicare beneficiaries uh, are due to the Medicare cuts that are part of the Affordable Care Act are gonna have decreases in, in services. Uh, that too, I'm not sure is a bad thing. Many of those cuts are gonna come through uh, payment reductions uh, in the Medicare Advantage program, uh, payment reductions to plans that were paid uh, well above the average fee-for-service cost in the areas that they were serving. Uh, those extra payments were translated, uh, at least in part, into more generous benefits for beneficiaries, which the beneficiaries liked, not surprisingly, and some of those are gonna go away. 
as a result of the Affordable Care Act. And uh, again, that might be good, that might be bad, but uh, there's gonna be a bunch of people who uh, either have to start paying more Medicare Advantage premiums, or are gonna lose their Medicare Advantage plans, or are gonna lose a bunch of benefits. Uh, so they're gonna be, uh, they're gonna be uh, hurt, essentially, by it. Um, rest of Medicare, we'll talk about in a second. The third group of people affected on the private insurance uh, side um, are people in the small group and individual market. Um, those people are the ones who are gonna be most affected uh, by the Affordable Care Act because uh, the act restructures those insurance markets. It left alone the large employer and self-insured markets. Uh, on the small group and individual market, um, it imposed a modified community rating and guaranteed issue rules um, effectively that uh, say that you can't turn down people or charge them based on their health status and limits what you can charge them based on their age. Well, so some people in the individual and small group market are gonna see their premiums go down because of that. People who were ill or who had very high premiums will have a benefit. Um, some people uh, are gonna see their net premiums go down because they're gonna now get an income-based subsidy as a result of the act. Uh, that's really not their premiums, that's, that's they're getting a, a subsidy from the government to help defray the cost of their premiums, but, but it will be a benefit to them for sure because now they're gonna get a transfer payment to help them afford their health insurance better. Uh, some people, however, are not gonna get a subsidy and are gonna see their premiums go up a lot. Uh, and you're seeing that in the newspaper now, people getting their insurance canceled. Um, this is a totally foreseeable and indeed in intended consequence of the Affordable Care Act uh, because what we need to do in order to finance the uh, expansion of community-rated coverage to people is to get the people who were paying less because they had relatively good health status to start paying more in the community rated market to help subsidize the people who were having to pay a lot more in the, in the um, experience rated market. Anyway, the best that can be said uh, is that, uh, is not that your premiums are gonna go down, it's that your premiums are probably gonna go up a little bit for most of you. Uh, if you have a low to moderate income, you're gonna get a transfer payment and that's gonna uh, be good for you, uh, but then there is a block of you you know, some number of millions of people who are gonna, uh, whose premium, who your premiums are gonna go up a lot. Uh, and so, you know, that's sort of uh, point number one in this difficult uh, set of trade-offs is gonna be a, a bit of a mixed bag. Um, so let's talk about the, the second uh, point here, the taxes and government deficits uh, point. Uh, probably the biggest selling point for the Affordable Care Act was that it was gonna, is that it's gonna reduce the budget deficit. Uh, or as that's presented by the law's supporter, it's gonna save money. So this claim is still being made, uh, and it's the least credible claim uh, in the uh, process of selling the Affordable Care Act at all. Um, its basis is that when coupled with the increased taxes that are part of the act, uh, and uh, uh, the Medicare reimbursement reductions that are part of the act, the increase in government outlays from the coverage expansion are gonna be more than covered by the extra taxes and the uh, reductions in Medicare spending. And so uh, that's gonna reduce the deficit, right? Okay, well, uh, yes, that depends on two assumptions. The first assumption is that the Medicare reimbursement reductions that are in the act are not gonna get undone, okay? They're not gonna be undone by future Congresses because if they were, then of course you couldn't use them to finance the coverage expansion in, in the Affordable Care Act. Uh, the second assumption, assuming that those Medicare reimbursement reductions are not undone, is that the savings from them should be credited against the cost of the Affordable Care Act's uh, coverage expansion even though the Medicare program itself is in the long run insolvent, okay? So if you want to say that the Affordable Care Act reduces the deficit, you have to believe those two assumptions. Just incidentally, the claim does not depend on assumptions about the revenues from the uh, Affordable Care Act taxes or any reduction in the consumption of real resources because 
uh, there's no way that the Affordable Care Act taxes and sort of reallocation of real resources can finance the coverage expansion. No one has ever claimed that. It's not, it's not even close. It's roughly half. Roughly half of it can be financed through the taxes on high-income people. And the rest of it comes from these Medicare uh, reductions. Well, so how can you see, how, how can you see that these deficit claims are fundamentally um, not true? Well, what they're doing is allowing Congress to use Medicare savings to finance a new entitlement program, even though Medicare itself is insolvent. Uh, if you believe this reasoning, then Congress could claim that a new war was deficit neutral as long as the authorization for force was passed in the same bill as a Medicare reduction, right? But that's, that's totally ridiculous. A war isn't deficit neutral. The money has to come from somewhere. And of course, the same thing, the same thing is true here. The fundamental problem is that the deficit reduction claim is made relative to a future world that we know is never going to come to pass. OK? So how do we know that? Uh, let's talk about the uh, Medicare reimbursement rate reductions. Um, the most notable example of Medicare reimbursement reductions is the uh, DOC fix, the sustainable growth rate uh, fix. And this is this problem. It was passed in the budget, Balanced Budget Act of 1997, I believe, which limits reimbursement to physicians in the Medicare program to GDP growth, some function of GDP growth of, of some sort. Um, and it was enacted as part uh, of the BBA to, as a way to control spending, perfectly you know, sensible thing, you might think, but uh, all but one Congress since then has undone the uh, sustainable growth rate limitations. And you understand why, because certainly at this point, the SGR uh, drop, were it to allow it to be, be imposed, would be like a 25, I don't know what the exact number is, but something like a 25% reduction in compensation to physicians practicing in Medicare, which j you just couldn't do that. I mean, uh, or if you did, there would be big service consequences as a result. Uh, now that's inside of the uh, Affordable Care Act assumptions. Uh, and the real deception of the SGR uh, is the magic, it, it lies in the magic of compounding. So every year that we let this go, uh, it, it compounds on itself, and so the savings from not changing the doc fix in out years of the Affordable Care Act is bigger, it gets bigger and bigger, right? Because every time we're, we're sort of working off a smaller base and saying we're not gonna, we're gonna impose this, this cut on doctors that's been accumulating for years and years. And, and so, you know, of course we can't do that, but, um, but if we can't do that, then, then how is it that we're gonna use that money uh, to offset the perhaps reasonable desire to I expand, expand coverage? Um, well, does this mean that the Affordable Care Act was the wrong thing to do? No. That's not what I'm saying here. Not necessarily. You might believe that the redistribution inherent in the act is worth these costs, and that's, that's okay, but that's a very different argument than what the supporters uh, have made, okay? It's a much more nuanced argument, uh, and if that's the argument, then that's what we need to have uh, as, as a country. Okay, I'm gonna go back to my principles now, um, having uh, talked about the Affordable Care Act a little bit. The more is not necessarily better is the second principle. So, from a clinical perspective, I think people here uh, probably are agree that uh, more is not always better, right? Treatments always involve uh, risks uh, as well as benefits. Um, risks of side effects, uh, some risks that are unintended but probabilistically inevitable, like the risk of medical errors. Um, uh, there's also the emotional cost of medical treatment to people, which is often not counted, but given uh, this is a, an ethics uh, series, I think is important to think about. 
uh, and other factors like anxiety. Uh, another thing that is worth thinking of, um, it's just a, a little advertisement for my friends at, at Dartmouth. Um, the risks of more, uh, as they call it, uh, the Dartmouth people have started a fascinating new project called uh, Preventing Overdiagnosis, where they're seeking to quantify the risks of more. Uh, and if you go to their website, if you Google them, uh, you'll get to see this. Uh, it's a very long uh, list that they're working on, misuse of antipsychotics, um, misuse of narcotics, uh, back surgeries, overuse of uh, radiation intensive imaging, uh, lots of interesting stuff from the Dartmouth people on this. So I think, we're, I think we can pretty much agree that more care is not necessarily better. But the principle goes even further. Um, is more, uh, is more Medicaid better? Should we have a lot more Medicaid? Well, this summer, uh, researchers, researchers from Harvard Medical School uh, gave us at least a partial answer to that uh, when they evaluated uh, a randomized trial of an expansion of Medicaid in Oregon. Uh, and what they found, uh, I won't go into too much detail here because I assume folks here have looked at this paper, but if you haven't, it's a, great, a very interesting paper. Uh, it's a New England Journal article uh, uh, from this summer. Uh, what they did was they looked, uh, in 2008, Oregon expanded its Medicaid program uh, from lottery drawings on a waiting list, because uh, they had some extra funds, but they had more people who wanted Medicaid than they could afford to provide it to, so they had a lottery. And they followed the people that they gave Medicaid to uh, and the people that they didn't give it to, that they denied access to the program randomly to uh, because they didn't have the money to, to cover them. And what they found was uh, no significant effect on any measures of physical health of the Medicaid beneficiaries uh, who got the expanded coverage versus the people who didn't. Very disappointing, extremely disappointing result uh, that the medical care uh, being delivered uh, was not in a randomized trial having measurable consequences for people, people's physical health. They did find that the uh, Medicaid benefits um, reduced people's financial strain uh, and uh, reduced emotional problems associated with the financial strain. But you know that might just be due to the financial support that the Medicaid benefit was providing and have nothing to do with the health insurance at all. Uh, they weren't able to distinguish whether uh, it was the Medicaid or if it was just the act of giving something to somebody that's worth a couple of thousand dollars uh, who, has a very, who has a very low income. So what do we make of this? Um, does this mean that Medicaid uh, is a waste of money? That's what some people have said. No, it absolutely does not mean that. Uh, not necessarily. What it means is more Medicaid, expanding Medicaid, at least in terms of measurable health outcomes, does not seem to be delivering a terrific performance to us. Um, what are some alternatives to this? Well, uh, in San Francisco, we have a program called uh, Healthy San Francisco, which is a, a non-Medicaid approach to providing a basic set of health services uh, knit together from existing safety net programs uh, for people who have low to moderate incomes. There's a very interesting article by Mark Hall, uh, who's a, a law school professor um, in uh, health affairs, I think it's in 2011, that looks at a bunch of programs like Healthy San Francisco, non-Medicaid programs that try to deliver services to people uh, using existing safety net programs and knitting them together in a constructive way uh, at a much lower cost than Medicaid. Um, they find that these programs are successful and are able to do it much more cheaply. Uh, the, those evaluations are not randomized trials, so it's always a, a tough nut to crack. You know, to what extent is this just the people who go into this less acute uh, safety net program, lower cost people than, than the folks who really need intensive care and have to go on Medicaid? Nonetheless, I think the results are uh, very suggestive and super interesting um, in light of the very disappointing findings from uh, the Oregon uh, experiment. Okay, so that's my second uh, principle of, uh, of health reform. What about the third principle? 
So the third principle is everybody uh, who can has to start paying more. Um, and so if you agree that more of the same stuff is not necessarily better, then I think you've got to at least consider the possibility um, that everybody who can pay more has to start paying more. Uh, so paying more at the point of service is a proven way to reduce consumption of, of health services. There's a long line of research starting with the RAND experiment from the 1970s that shows that higher co-payments um, reduce people's consumption of health services. Now, making people pay more uh, involves some trade-offs. Uh, so higher co-payments reduce the consumption of care that doesn't provide a lot of benefits. Uh, but sometimes it also reduces consumption of care that does provide benefits. Um, it also reduces risk protection. Uh, it also has the potential to increase inequality. Uh, if you, certainly if you make everybody pay the same amount more, uh, that's, that's definitely going to increase uh, inequality. Now, the fact that there's a trade-off here is often viewed as an indictment of this principle. Uh, but although there's, a, there's reasonable concerns about the downsides to this that I just talked about, um, that doesn't mean that this is a bad idea. It means that there are reasonable concerns and that implementing it has to take account of those. My view is that we're so far out on the flat of the curve of health spending um, that any sensibly designed plan to change that has to make people pay more, especially people uh, who, who, who can. Um, let me um, talk about uh, some of the other reasons before I uh, go to the administrative uh, issue here. Let me talk about some of the other reasons why I think paying more is, is good. Um, reducing low value care, that's the sort of big thing. But there's lots of good things about people paying more. Another good thing about people paying more uh, is it will help contain provider market power. So uh, market power of doctors, and especially hospitals, and especially large hospitals, uh, is a real problem in this country. Uh, the prices of hospital services uh, are uh, going up uh, faster than inflation, and they're going up in places where markets are concentrated, where there's not good competition. Um, one reason for that, and this is a uh, I think an interesting research question, but one reason for that I, I will hypothesize is that people aren't paying uh, the full burden of these super competitive prices. And if people had to start to pay for more of it, there would be, there would be outrage. Um, something, things would happen. Uh, things would change. Things would start to change. Uh, pushback on provider market power. Price transparency. Everyone complains about how there's terrible price transparency in health care. Um, I completely agree. Uh, why is that? Well, part of it is that people aren't paying. Uh, and if people had to start to pay, there would be demand for price. People would demand transparency. I'll give you a, a, a story, which is a, it's, it's not directly relevant, but it's, it's an interesting story. So I. I had a, a, a sick dog, uh, my last dog, uh, old dog, very sweet animal, very sick. Uh, so I, uh, I take, the dog is not doing well, I take the dog to the vet. Uh, and you know, I say, I, she's, she's listless, she's not, you know, what, 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 what do I do, what are we gonna do here? Um, vet says, that's okay, hold on, let me get a nurse. Nurse comes out, uh, looks over the dog, does an examination, four minutes later, comes back with an estimate. And I was, I was kind of blown away. Uh, literally, it says, these are the things we think are wrong with your dog. Um, the cost of caring for it is between it was something like $700 to $1,300 or something. Uh, these are the factors that we use to do this. Is this OK with you? And I said, yes. I mean, it didn't, in the end, really help that much. But I, I love the dog. And, and of course, you know, if it were my mother, I mean, it would be a much harder conversation to have. <laughs> uh, I would probably go up, I'll go up a little bit uh, from there. Um, but the, the, the point of the story is that 
the idea that healthcare is too complicated and we can't, we just couldn't figure it out, I don't buy it. In some circumstances, maybe, uh, and th those are tough. In a lot of circumstances, no. Um, this was a complicated case. I mean, it was a complicated veterinary case, uh, indeed, but a complicated case. And the transparency, I was, I was just blown away um, by how quickly and uh, truthfully they were able to tell me what really was going to go on here. Third reason I think we should uh, think about paying more is that I think it will uh, uh, create a, a bottom-up demand for more effective forms of healthcare organization. Another complaint you hear, people say the fee-for-service system is terrible, why can't, pe why can't providers integrate, why can't we have more efficient forms of organization and, and compensation? Well, one of the reasons we don't is because nobody's paying for it. Uh, and if people had to start to pay, uh, they would insist that doctors not reorder tests that already uh, existed. They would insist that people uh, keep track of stuff better uh, than they do today. Um, but in the absence of anybody paying, very tough, um, very tough. Okay, so I, I think I've tried to make at least some case for why people should pay more. Um, one of the alternatives to paying more is uh, we should have more administrative approaches like those used in other countries, um, like the UK. Uh, and, you know, uh, I'm not sure that that's a, a bad idea or a good idea. Uh, I think there's a debate to be had about that. But what I'm quite confident of is that it's an unrealistic idea, um, that in this country, uh, there is no way uh, we're going to have effective administrative cost control, at least uh, from where we are at, at the present. At, in the future, potentially so. It's hard to say. The, the story that uh, I like to, to tell about this is the uh, Independent Payment Advisory Board, the IPAB, which is a 15-member panel, part of the Affordable Care Act, tasked with uh, recommending ways to reduce cost in the Medicare program. And there are two striking things about IPAB. Uh, one is about uh, how weak it is, um, and I've written about that. And it's, that's not a, I'm not the first or only person to have acknowledged this. this uh, I think people pretty much agree. The second thing, which I was sort of surprised about, um, is that it's the only piece of the Affordable Care Act that has bipartisan support for its repeal. And that's, that's true. Uh, the people who are in favor of repealing IPAB, uh, there's a, a new, uh, well, it's not new, there was a, a bill introduced in the House, Protecting Seniors to Medicare Act, uh, that's H.R. 351. Uh, and uh, the folks who've come out in favor of this range from Sarah Palin, um, whom I'm sure you all know, to Howard Dean, uh, who was uh, the senator um, from, uh, the senator from Vermont. Um, I'm not kidding about Howard Dean. Google Howard Dean and IPAB, and you'll see uh, he says that IPAB is the wrong thing to do. Um, finally, I think if you're going to talk about administrative approaches, you've got to talk about them, how they actually work in practice, not how they work ideally. And when we talk about uh, using prices to allocate health resources, uh, we're concerned about inequality, and I think rightly so. Uh, but administrative approaches create their own inequalities. Um, the idea that uh, administrative approaches to cost control allocate treatments on the basis of need rather than on the basis of socioeconomic status or, or income, that's just not true. In fact, there's a, a very interesting uh, series of papers on this topic about the UK NHS written by some economists. Uh, there's one in um, Journal of Health Economics that show that there's substantial inequality in waiting times uh, in the UK NHS across areas based on the socioeconomic status of the people who live there. And so, you know, that's not saying that administrative approaches are bad necessarily, but just that uh, to the extent one is concerned about inequality, you're not going to solve that by not using prices. Um, so, very important. Uh, it's going to be difficult. Um, you can't 
demand the same point of service payment of everyone. And that's obviously true. Uh, but I think that as a starting point, we need policies that, at least for privately insured, employed people, uh, for people like that, those people need to start uh, paying more uh, at the point of service. And tax policies that encourage people to get um, more cost conscious insurance uh, are an excellent step in that direction. I've written a whole bunch of uh, stuff about that people want to talk about. Well, I think I'm about uh, nearing my time. So let me, let me sort of wrap up here. Um, just to summarize, whatever you think about our current path of health reform, um, getting ourselves out of the hole that we've dug for ourselves in healthcare, uh, it's been a long process to, to, to dig this hole, a long series of policy choices over the past uh, 40 or, or so years, um, and it's gonna be tough to get out of. It's gonna involve a lot of difficult trade-offs. Um, it's not gonna be done without sacrifice from people. Uh, and I think what we need to start thinking of is that more is not better uh, and that everybody has to start paying more at the point of service as, as, much, as, as much as they can. So uh, that's what I have. And I'll stop there and take questions. Thank you. Uh, thank you. I appreciate your talk. Uh, your comments in response to the survey data from about a year ago that it showed a positive association uh, between, I think, three states, both red and blue politically, uh, Pennsylvania, New York, and Arizona, associated with penetrated, uh, mortality benefit associated with Medi Medicaid penetration. I'm sorry, I don't understand. So, I don't so, so the, the survey data, and this was, uh, I saw this in the, in the, uh, in the public media, uh, a, a mortality benefit for states that had a, lar a larger percentage of Medicaid penetration, and they were New York, Pennsylvania, and I think Arizona. Oh, decreased mortality. Decreased mortality. Uh, that, that could be true. I, I'm not aware of this paper. I mean, that's, there's a long series of papers that show uh, an effect of insurance coverage on health based on observational data, uh, of which this one sounds like it is a part. Um, the problem with all those papers is that uh, there's often other things going on at the same time that may lead both to the uh, differences in insurance coverage and the differences in health outcomes. And uh, so it's for that reason that uh, experimental data, like the article published in the New England Journal uh, is so interesting and so um, illuminating. So I know there's a long series of papers that show insurance benefits health. Uh, the problem is there's unobserved factors that are going on and it's hard to know how important those are. And it was this study that uh, essentially answered that question. So sticking with that topic, um, I thought that study mimicked the RAND experiment finding, which was essentially if you have lower co-pays, you use a lot more health services, but you don't have a lot of health impact in some sense. And in regards to the health outcomes, why is that really an issue? Suppose I paid your house for you and you had a $200,000 house. I'm sure you have a nicer house, but let's say you have a 200000 right. Well, in California, in you can't California, buy any you house for you $200,000. Get an house for $200. <laughs> you can't buy a parking space. So if mm -hmm. I paid your house and you kept your house, you're about two hundred grand better off when I did that. Right. So why do I care whether health outcomes, if Medicaid beneficiaries are now not paying for their health insurance, they're approximately better off by how much you're paying for their health insurance, and why do I need a health effect for the success of the program? In fact, economists would say the less distortion there is by the program, the better. So you would actually want full crowd out. That's an ideal situation uh, because you're not distorting their insurance choice. You're just giving them money for the same thing they're buying. So why isn't that the right way to think about this, the welfare effects of this program as opposed to mortality or health outcomes? Yes, yeah, so that's, that's an excellent question. Um, there are two reasons why, that's not, why I don't think that's the right way to think about 
uh, the program. The first and most important reason is that the way that it's sold uh, is that Medicaid is necessary and insurance is necessary to improve people's health. Right? That's how it's sold politically, that's how it's sold. And uh, to the extent that there's no evidence for that, then that's not honest. That's not facing up to what the facts are. Uh, the, the second piece of this is that um, I, I do believe that Medicaid makes people better off because it's worth something. I mean, it, it's, it's better than not having Medicaid for sure. But if what you want to do is make low to moderate income people better off, uh, then you should just give them the money, right? I mean, and by giving them Medicaid instead, you're creating an ineff inefficiency because many of them would have preferred just to have the cash. Right, I mean, that's what, what you're saying is, why shouldn't we just give them the Medicaid if it makes them better off? Well, if the goal is solely to increase the living standards of the people in that income range, the most efficient way to do that is to give them the money, not to give them an in-kind benefit. And that's, that is not an unreasonable thing to suggest. I mean, I definitely can see the argument for expanding transfers to low-income people. Some people like that, some people don't like that. Um, but that's not the way this has been discussed. Actually, can I just follow up on that? Yeah, go ahead. I feel like I have to channel Casey Mulligan and ask, uh, how do you do helicopter drops to poor people, poor people that even might have uh, serious health problems, without distorting their behavior or their incentives to earn money? Well, you, you can't. Um, and that's a cost of any means-tested transfer program, be it Medicaid, the earned income tax credit, anything. And, but that doesn't mean you shouldn't have means-tested transfer programs, right? Because I, I think most of us agree that there should be some safety net programs out there. The question is how big? Uh, and that's, you know, you have to trade off the budget cost, the labor market distortion against the improved equity that you get. That's just a fundamental trade-off. So your answer to Thomas is that it could be that Medicaid is a, we want to judge it on its distortive effects relative to other ways to help poor people. Yeah, I mean, if the goal is to raise the incomes of low to moderate income people, then the best way to do that is to give them money, um, not to give them health insurance, unless you believe that the act of the health insurance makes them healthier or somehow makes them better off than giving them the money. Uh, yes. That's certainly, it's certainly true that there are other reasons why you want in-kind benefits. Oh, yeah, I don't, I'm less a fan of that kind of thinking, personally, but. There's other reasons, put it that way. So there's many reasons why you might want to give in-kind with this cash. Given that we have an in-kind program, right. it, they're better off by the amount you're giving them in the premium to start with regardless of whether they have better health or not. Yeah, I, I tend to think people, even if you don't have a lot of money, you're probably the best judge of how to lead, lead your own life. But other people disagree, I understand. Um, I mean, I, I think you know, there's, there, I, there's, a, there's, a, there's a lot of experiments in the Affordable, health, Affordable Care Act which are quite interesting about trying to get better value. Um, I think uh, accountable care organizations have, you know, have some potential. They also have some, some risks uh, to them. Uh, I think uh, you know, paying for performance in Medicare has a lot of potential. Uh, so I, I think there's some neat stuff in there. Um, on the other hand, I think if we're really serious about getting better value, there has to be uh, more demand side engagement. Uh, and you know, again, it's tough because you can't do it at all points in the expenditure distribution. You can't do it for people who don't have any money to start with. But there's a lot of us uh, for whom you can do it. And you know, all you need for a market to work is enough people to be in there being conscientious. Every single person in every single decision doesn't have to be doing the perfect right thing. You just need some people that are forcing better value. And so that's, um, that's where I'm coming from. Right. Um, I have a 
the other finding, as I understand it from the New England Journal um, article, or at least I know from the study itself, is that depression did actually go way down. And so I was curious, you know, why not mention that as well, that that's clearly a health benefit of being covered, right? I would think mental health benefits, not just physical, but mental health is, a, there, there was a significant difference um, in that randomized trial. Just to follow up on the other point as well, that, <clears throat> you know, the, the main value we get from insurance is financial protection. And they did get that. That was the other part of the finding, right? That people that were covered under Medicaid did better financially. I mean, I think that's the transfer um, that he's talking about. So to say give them cash directly, they can go purchase individual health coverage, but it's not going to be nearly as affordable as purchasing, like in the Arkansas private option, if you want to give them cash, at least then give them access to a so-called pooled insurance marketplace where they can uh, purchase affordable health coverage. So just curious what you think about that as well. Uh, you might be right. Um, the experiment uh, didn't, didn't say whether, give, so how much does Medicaid cost organ to give to people. I, I don't know what the number is. It's probably two or three thousand dollars per capita per year, something like that. Um, in order to answer the question you're asking, what you'd have to do is randomly give people in the same circumstances a cash benefit of two to three thousand dollars and see if their depression and their financial anxiety declined by the same amount uh, or more or less. We don't know. Um, the point that I'm making is that there's no evidence that it is the Medicaid that did that um, because we didn't compare it against giving people the money. And if, if the argument is that uh, what we want to do is to increase transfers to low, uh, low and moderate income people uh, and the only political way to do that is by giving them health insurance regardless of its value relative to cash to them, that's okay. That's an argument. That's not the way that, that's not the argument that's been made. One of my questions is how does, so a large part of the Affordable Care Act is trying to address not only things like the uninsured and healthcare inequality, but also health cost inflation, particularly things like medical devices. Um, how would that change your calculus of whether or not the act could pay for itself? What, uh, can you tell me what elements of the act are reducing uh, cost inflation in medical devices. I, I, I'm not aware of those. I don't know specifics, but I know that this is part of the impetus for the act, is that health costs for the same services tend to rise year, year over year for certain things. Um, for instance, the New York Times has been writing articles on asthma inhalers and how the cost is going up and not down for the exact same inhalers. I'm, I'm certainly aware of the Times articles uh, that um, I forget the reporter's name, and they're very, they're excellent. They're wonderful. Those, it's a wonderful series of pieces. Um, I'm not aware of anything in the Affordable Care Act that's going to change that. But I'm ready. If anybody knows of anything, you can tell me about it. I, I, I yeah, don't I don't know, know of anything. Hypothetically, so. would that, could that change your calculus? I mean, if that were part of the Affordable Care Act. And I'm sorry. That I don't know. Sure, I mean, if, if it could, that'd be great. Um, unfortunately, I think part of the reason why we have this, all this price dispersion uh, that these, the, the Times reporter is talking about, um, a very interesting series of articles, is because people aren't paying. And that when people started to pay, you'd get less price dispersion. If I could just follow up on this. That'd be my bet. I mean, I don't know. That's a hypothesis. Not, I don't have evidence. So some people said that the iPad will bend the cost curve. Can you tell us your thoughts on that? Oh, yeah. I, I don't think that's, I mean, I just don't think that's likely to happen. I mean, uh, I've, I've written a, a uh, I've written about this. Other pe a bunch of people have written about it. There's too many loopholes uh, in the way that um, Congress can get around IPAB mandated reductions. And th that was intentional on Congress's part. And, and in fact, the fact, I mean, the fact that we've got uh, these bipartisan bills to, you know, get rid of the whole thing altogether when it hasn't even come into effect and hasn't even done anything yet, I, I, 
you know, you never know. CBO scored it as having essentially no effect. Maybe it'll have, it would be wonderful if it could work. I mean. We can take one more question, maybe two, but one, let's do one. I guess it's a little hard for me to wrap my head around the idea that uh, making people pay more will make that much difference when there's uh, you know, more than a million people filing for bankruptcy because of medical costs, and two-thirds of those people already have insurance, and we already pay more out of pocket for costs in America than anywhere else in the world. It just doesn't make a whole lot of sense to make us start paying more, because presumably that's going to increase the medical bankruptcies, it's going to, you know, uh, already put a strain on, on us as it is. I, you know, if, if there were a way to sort of get us out of this situation with no one having to sacrifice anything, that would be great. Uh, I, I, just, I just don't see where it's going to come from. I mean, uh, just wishing the problem would go away, I, I just don't see how that's going to do it. Uh, and, you know, medical bankruptcies, I mean, that is, this is another downside to this, and I think the inequality, at, it, those are serious concerns. They're not, they're not silly concerns, but I, I think the fact that we have let this problem get so out of control outweighs those concerns, and those concerns can be addressed um, by, for example, helping people with low incomes who are in bad circumstances to make the payments that they need to make. I mean, obviously they should not be on the hook to the same extent that I am, but the fact that, that my parents in Medicare uh, don't pay anything at point of service is, it, it just doesn't make any sense. Dr. Um, thank, thank you. Could I, could I ask you a political question? We're, we're, we're in the midst of the Accountable Care Act, Affordable Care Act, and, and th this version of health reform, just, just as a political matter, how, how do we, as a society, move towards the Kessler three principles of reform when, when we're just at the beginning of this other reform effort? <clears throat> you know, it's, uh, I don't know. I mean, um, we may have to let this play out for a while. I, d I just don't know. Uh, I, th I think the, the real sacrifice and I've written about this, has is, is got to come from people with employer-sponsored insurance, big employer-sponsored insurance, who need to be moved towards a higher co-payment, um, higher responsibility world. And, you know, that's a lot of people. That's most Americans. It's the plurality of Americans. And that's why politicians are very reluctant to do that. Um, but I, I'm afraid you know, that's, that's beyond my pay grade. You know, you know, a few weeks ago, Helen Darling was here oh, yeah. speaking for the large employers. Um, very delighted that they were the ones who got the one-year delay um, in, in the implementation of the policy and seeming not too eager to, <laughs> to add to the costs of their health insurance. Yeah. We have a very profitable medical system in our country. Uh, the McKinsey report from three or four years ago identified the sources of excess costs in our system compared to other industrialized countries and found about two thirds of that was due to uh, the <clears throat> rapid rise of ambulatory surgery centers and other outpatient care because that gets away from the DRG cap. And then the other one third comes from insurance companies and pharmaceuticals and those are very profitable industries. So it, it seems to me, I do hear your acknowledgement that administrative approaches don't work, but it seems to me like we're, that's the elephant in the room and it's a political third rail. And I think that's a place we need to talk about because when you talk about Iron Triangle, it assumes that nothing changes inside there, but those are things that could be changed. Right, I mean, um, th there are things that could be changed, certainly. I mean, uh, you know, the ph with regard to the pharmaceutical growth in pharmaceutical spending, I mean, I think a lot of that uh, is covered by what I'm saying. I mean, if people complain about Me Too drugs, about you know investments by drug companies in molecules that provide relatively minimal health benefits, but that then have these huge profits and huge. Well, what? Why is it that that happens? If they, if that's really true. Well, 
I mean, it happens because nobody's paying, <laughs> right? If people were starting to pay, then people would say, you know, I don't want the Me Too drug. Uh, I don't want Nexium. I'm not going to pay for Nexium when I can have Prilosec. People would would raise more of a fuss, and you know, it, until that happens, you know, maybe we should try administrative approaches. I think there are trade-offs associated with those too. I'm not optimistic, given the one attempt that we've had so far, which has go gone, you know, not going so far. Um. All right, well, I think we should wrap up Q&A. I know that uh, Mark wants to uh, yeah. answer I, I just want to thank everyone for coming and joining me. Thank you. Thank you.